Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 37. In this lecture, we'll discuss angular motion. This topic is covered in Chapter 10 of our textbook by Sirway and Joet. So far in the semester, we've been considering mostly linear motion. Linear motion is also known as translational motion. In linear motion, all points of the object have the same instantaneous velocity. All points of the object are essentially doing the same thing. They're all moving in the same direction uh, with the same speed at any given instant in time. For example, consider the motion of a box as it slides across the floor. As it does so, every atom of that box or every point of that box would have the same velocity vector. The box might slow down and speed up, but all the atoms do so together. So if this velocity vector here becomes larger, then the velocity vector here becomes larger as well. You can also pick up this box and throw it across the room, in which case you would have projectile motion. But projectile motion is also an example of linear motion. Certainly, if this box were flying across the room, these velocity vectors would be different. For example, this atom here might now moving with, might be moving with this type of a velocity vector, but as that atom moves in that direction, so does this atom, and so does this atom, and so does this atom, and so does this one. The point is projectile motion, at least the type we've been considering so far, is an example of linear motion because all atoms or all points of the object have the same instantaneous velocity. This doesn't have to be the case all the time. Angular motion, also known as rotational motion, is quite different. Different points of the object may have different velocities. Consider the spinning motion of this wheel, and you would see that an atom or a point on the top of the wheel moves to the right, while an atom at the bottom of the wheel moves to the left. And the atom at the center of the wheel does not move at all, its velocity is zero. So clearly the, sh the points shown here all have different velocity vectors, even though they're all parts or points on the same object. We can also combine these two types of motion. We can combine linear and angular motion, which is what you would get if this wheel were, for example, the wheel of a bicycle rolling along on a flat surface, as shown here in this animation. The motion of the center of the wheel is quite simple. It moves along a perfectly straight line. But if we were to trace out the motion of a point on the rim of the wheel, we would see that the motion is quite complicated. This type of motion that's being traced out here is referred to as a cycloid. We might also be interested in the velocity vector of that point on the rim. The velocity vector is, of course, always tangent to the path being followed. And as you can see here, the velocity vector is tangent to the cycloid. To better understand the behavior of the velocity vector, we can decompose it into two components. We can say that the motion of this wheel consists of linear motion indicated by one of these vectors pointing to the right and angular motion or circular motion indicated by the second of these vectors shown here. The sum of those two gives us the diagonal vector, which is the actual velocity vector of the object. As you can see, this type of motion can be quite complicated, and our goal in this and the next few lectures is to be able to understand this type of motion quantitatively. We can summarize the discussion on the previous slide by saying that there are two types of motion. One type of motion is pure rotational motion or pure angular motion. In this type of motion, different points on the wheel um, have different velocity vectors, and each one executes circular motion relative to the center of the wheel. The second type of motion is pure translational motion or linear motion, in which different points on the wheel would have the same velocity vector. This is what you might have if this wheel were the wheel of a bicycle and you're riding your bicycle on a wet, slippery surface and you suddenly apply the brakes. When you apply the brakes, you lock the wheels of your bicycle 
and then the bicycle wheels slide or skid across the slippery surface. In that case, we would say that the bicycle wheel is executing pure translational motion because every point, including the center and points on the rim of the wheel, have exactly the same velocity vector. Of course, under normal circumstances, as you're riding your bicycle along, what we have is a combination of rotational motion and translational motion, which is sometimes described as rolling motion. To find the velocity vectors of different points on the bicycle wheel, we now have to add the two velocity vectors from rotational motion and translational motion. To find the velocity vector of a point at the top of the wheel, for example, we would add this velocity vector to this velocity vector, which would give us a velocity vector that's basically twice as big. For the center of the wheel, we would add this velocity vector to this velocity vector, which is zero, and we would essentially get this velocity vector. Something interesting happens at the bottom of the wheel. When we add this vector to this vector, note that they are pointing in opposite directions, and therefore they cancel each other out. We find that the point at the bottom of the wheel at that moment in time has zero velocity or is at rest. For points on the right of the wheel, we similarly add this vector to this vector, which gives us a diagonal vector pointing down. And for a point on the left of the wheel, we would add this vector to this vector, which gives us another diagonal vector pointing upwards and to the right. This type of vector addition is simple enough. However, as you can see, rotational motion in general complicates things quite a bit. Even in the case of pure rotation, we have to specify four different vectors for four different points on the rim. This is not really a satisfactory approach to studying rotation. In the remainder of this lecture, we want to develop a more efficient way of describing rotation. Ideally, we would like to be able to describe the rotation of a disk or a wheel using a single vector. As a warm-up for our study of angular motion, let's do a practice problem first. A car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms moves with a constant speed of 20 meters per second. The tires, which have a radius of 40 centimeters, rotate without slipping. How many turns has each tire rotated after time t equals 4 seconds? So we have a car that is moving along a perfectly straight line with a speed of 20 meters per second. We could easily use the kinematic equations that we learned a while back to figure out the distance that the car would travel in four seconds. In this problem, however, the focus isn't really the car. Our focus is on the spinning wheels. We want to know how many turns each, rot each tire rotates after this period of time. We are assuming that the um, car has adequate traction and therefore the tires are rotating without slipping. So there is no skidding in this problem. What that means is that every time a tire rotates one full turn, the car must advance one circumference worth of distance. So one rotation of each tire corresponds to a particular distance equal to the circumference of the tire. Now we should first probably just figure out how far the car travels in four seconds. We could use the kinematic equations to answer that question However, since the speed is constant, we can simply multiply speed by time to find that the distance traveled by the car is 80 meters. Now we said that with every rotation of the tire, the car advances one circumference worth of distance. The circumference of the tire can be calculated by this formula, 2 pi r, substituting in the radius of the tire remembering that it's in centimeters and therefore we must do a conversion to meters, we find that the circumference of the tires is 2.513 meters. We can now answer the question, how many turns does each tire rotate? If we're advancing 80 meters and one turn corresponds to 2.5 meters, we can simply divide the distance by the circumference. So the number of turns n is going to be 31.83 turns.
Now this is 31.83 turns or revolutions of the tires. Going forward, we're going to often use degrees or radians as our measurements for rotation. And so we can convert this number to radians. In other words, we can take n and multiply it by 2 pi, recognizing that there are 2 pi radians to each turn or revolution of the tires, which would tell us that the tires rotate through 200 radians in 4 seconds. Our goal in this lecture and the next is to essentially understand angular motion in the same way that we understand linear motion. If you recall, our discussion of linear motion began by introducing the motion variables x, v, and a. We talked about position and velocity and acceleration. We essentially want to do the same thing with angular motion. We want to introduce a new set of variables that we will call the angular motion variables. If an object like a wheel or a sphere is rotating, then a point on that object is going to go through an angular displacement. So the very first thing we want to know is the angular position of that point. This angular variable will be denoted using the letter theta. Its SI units will be radians. Occasionally we'll talk about degrees, sometimes we'll talk about turns or revolutions or cycles, but our preferred unit is the radians. You should know that 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians, and you should know that one revolution or one cycle or one complete turn is equal to 2 pi radians. So you should be able to convert between the SI and the non-SI units. Now, as the object rotates or turns, the angular position of a point on the object is going to change. We want to know how fast that angular position is changing. We want to know the rate of change in theta, and that quantity is called angular velocity. Angular velocity is denoted using the Greek letter omega, and as you might guess, omega is simply the derivative of theta with respect to time. Theta is measured in radians and time is measured in seconds, so the SI unit of angular velocity is radians per second. A common non-SI unit is the RPM, which is often used in um, industrial applications. One RPM simply stands for one round or one revolution per minute. So you should know that one RPM is really 2 pi divided by 60 radians per second. Of course, the angular velocity of an object could change as well. A disk that is spinning could slow down or spin faster. We often want to know how fast the angular velocity is changing. That brings us to angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is denoted by the Greek letter alpha, and it is the derivative of omega with respect to time although you can think of it as the second derivative of theta with respect to time as well. The SI unit of angular acceleration, as you might guess, is radians per second per second or radians per second squared. I just introduced you to the angular motion variables theta, omega, and alpha. As it turns out, these angular motion variables are in fact vectors, just like the linear motion variables. So the question is, which way do these vectors point? If we're looking at a um, spinning bicycle wheel, which way does the angular velocity vector omega point? Or more generally, how do we represent the motion of any extended rigid body using a vector? You might be tempted to use the linear um, velocity vector to do so. However, you run into a problem very quickly when you consider the simplest example. Imagine a disk that is spinning. If you look at a point on the right side of the disk, its linear velocity vector would be tangent to the circle and it would point straight up. Unfortunately, if you looked at other points on that disk, the velocity vector would point in different directions. For example, on the left side of the disk, it would point down. And if you looked at points along the radius of the disk, they might point in the same direction, but they would have different magnitudes. 
So a point out here on the rim has to travel quite fast because it has to travel a large distance in one period, but a point closer to the center has to travel a shorter distance in one period, in one cycle of the, of the disk, and therefore it doesn't need to travel as fast. So different points of this disk will have totally different velocity vectors with different magnitudes and different directions, and this becomes a problem for us. We would like to have a single velocity vector that represents the entire motion of this disk. We can see what the answer is a little bit better if we look at this disk from a different perspective. If you look at the disk from the side, you notice that the disk has something called an axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is basically a line through the object and every point of the disk is going to be executing circular motion around the axis of rotation. So different points on the disk are going to be moving at different speeds and in different directions, but the axis of rotation of the disk remains fixed. This suggests to us that we should represent the motion of this disk using a vector that points along the axis of rotation. So in fact, we choose the axis of rotation as the orientation for the angular velocity vector. Now you might be thinking, why did we choose the angular velocity vector to point up? We could have just as well chosen the angular velocity vector to point down. This is really a matter of convention, just so that we can have agreement and consensus. We've adopted a rule called the right hand rule. According to the right hand rule, we take our right hand, we place our wrist at the center of rotation, somewhere on the axis of rotation, and then we curl our fingers around the disc in the same direction as its rotation, and then we stick out the thumb. The direction of the thumb is going to indicate the direction of the angular velocity vector. So the right hand rule is simply a convention for resolving the ambiguity of whether omega should point up or down along the axis of rotation. Make sure you're using your right hand and not your left hand, and remember that your thumb indicates the direction of the angular velocity vector. So far in the semester, we've been discussing mostly two-dimensional motion. We've been talking about the x-axis and the y-axis. However, to understand rotational motion, we need to talk about all three dimensions of space. We need to talk about the x, the y, and the z axes all at the same time. Unfortunately, drawing vectors in three-dimensional space can be difficult when we're limited to the plane of a piece of paper or a computer screen. So to avoid ambiguity, we're going to adopt some drawing conventions. For example, we might want to represent a coordinate system like the one shown here. The x and the y axes are supposed to be in the plane of the page, but the z axis in this picture is supposed to be coming out of the page into the third dimension. To represent this kind of a situation, we use this type of a picture. As you can see, the x and the y axes are quite clearly in the plane of the paper or the computer screen, and the z axis is now represented by a dot and a circle around it. The dot and a circle is supposed to remind you of a line or a vector that's pointing out of the page. You might also want to represent a different situation. In this situation, the x and the z axes are in the plane of the page, but the y axis here is supposed to be pointing into the page, pointing away from the viewer. Again, drawing this type of a thing is a little bit difficult, and it might be ambiguous as to what exactly the y-axis is doing, so we will draw this kind of a coordinate system like so. The x and the z-axis are in the plane of the page, or the screen, and the y-axis is now represented by an x with a circle around it, indicating a vector or a line that is going into the page away from the viewer. A nice mnemonic for remembering these conventions is to think of a bow and arrow. If you imagine firing an arrow from a bow, the feathered tail of that arrow might look something like this with an X. 
On the other hand, if someone fires an arrow at you, then the sharp pointed end of the arrow might look like this point here coming at you. So a dot with a circle around it represents a vector that points out of the page towards the viewer, but an X with a circle around it represents a vector into the page away from the viewer. Drawing nicely shaded three-dimensional figures can be quite difficult, so to represent a situation like this, we will often draw a picture like this. This vector pointing upwards is the angular velocity vector. If we focus on a point on the right edge of this disk, then at this moment in time, that point is going into the page, so we would represent its velocity vector by an X and a circle around it. On the other hand, a point on the left edge of this circle is coming at us, it's coming out of the page, so we would represent it using a dot with a circle around it. You might be interested in the motion of a disk that is rotating in this manner. Such a disk would be represented as such. The angular velocity vector would be pointing to the left, at the very top, that point would be going into the page, and at the very bottom, that point would be coming out of the page. Let's end this lecture with a practice problem. The angular velocity of a disk is shown below at times 0 seconds and 2 seconds. What is the disk's angular acceleration? Provide magnitude and direction. So we have a disk that is initially spinning, as indicated by this angular velocity vector. Initially, the magnitude of angular velocity is 13, let's say radians per second. After a while, the spinning slows down, so the final angular velocity vector will be 5 radians per second. If we adopt the type of coordinate system shown here, we can say that the angular velocity vectors point in the z direction. To be a little more precise, we could write the initial angular velocity vector as 0 in the x direction, 0 in the y direction, and 13 in the z direction. Similarly, the final angular velocity vector could be written as 0 in x, 0 in y, and 5 in the z direction. Now notice here we don't have the usual um, curly arrow that indicates exactly which way these disks are rotating. So if you want to know whether the disk is rotating in this sense or in this sense, you have to use the right hand rule. You have to take your right hand and put your wrist at the center of the disk, align your thumb with the angular velocity vector, and then your four fingers, whichever direction they're curling, they indicate the direction of rotation of the disk. For now, what we're really interested in is the angular acceleration vector, and we know that the angular acceleration vector is the change in the angular velocity vector. Not much is happening in the x and the y directions. Everything is happening in the z direction, so we'll calculate the z component of the angular acceleration vector. That is going to be equal to the change in the z component of omega with respect to time. The final minus initial gives us 5 minus 13, and of course delta t is 2 seconds, so the final time is 2 seconds, the initial time is 0 seconds, and when we put all of this into our calculator, we find that alpha in the z direction is minus 4 radians per second squared. This tells us that the angular acceleration vector is pointing in the negative z direction, if we wanted to draw the vector, we might draw something like this. Alpha points downwards, and its magnitude is going to be 4. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.